Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Crips AI and Data for Lunch webinar. My name is Matthew Holman, and I am a partner in the Crips commercial tech and data team. It's great to see you all. Thank you very much for giving up 45 minutes of your Monday to come and hang out with us. In return, we will give you a jam-packed session. We're going to look very briefly at a quick update and all the things that have happened since the last webinar. We're going to also look at the EU AI Act because we promised to do that, but we're only going to look at a very, very small part of it, a very skimming view, because the main thing we're going to do today is interview Lord Chris Holmes of Richmond, the member of the House of Lords who has published the UK AI regulation bill. I'm going to ask him some questions and you can ask him some questions too by using our live chat. We won't be able to do hands up, so if you do have a question, please just put it in the chat. It will come through the production guys there. It'll pop up in front of me on the screen and I'll put it to Chris. We will then, if we have time, hopefully end with three great things, uh, which is where we, uh, the, the junior researchers and the legal team uh, who do all the work that goes into this are going to come and share some of the fascinating insights uh, and things that AI has done since the last time we met. So without further ado, let's look at the update from uh, the last four weeks. What's been happening in the world of AI, tech and data? The first thing uh, I should mention in the update is that the European Data Protection Board has published its opinion on the pay or okay model. For those of you who can't remember, this is the um, this is all about meta predominantly and its decision to change its business model to one where you either pay to get access to the platforms and not have behavioral advertising or you consent to behavioral advertising. Unsurprisingly, uh, the EDPB's response was not favorable. They basically concluded throughout the whole thing that unless social media platforms can make consent comply with GDPR, then the model wouldn't work. The next big update is the Experian case. I know I keep banging on about it, but it is the biggest case in data protection so far this year. Uh, on the 24th of April, the European Data Protection Board, uh, sorry, the uh, Upper Tribunal, not the European Data Protection Board, handed down its decision in the Experian case and they decided not to overturn the first tier tribunal. The effect of that means that it's Experian 2 ICO one. We're going to do loads more on that case in the next webinar because it has huge ramifications for data protection. Uh, more on that to come. The next update is that Max Schrems, who I presume needs no introduction, has uh, taken up a complaint against OpenAI with the Austrian National Supervisory Authority. The essence of his complaint is that um, ChatGPT doesn't comply with UK GDPR or EU GDPR even, uh, and uh, we expect that to go the distance as well. Predominantly what he's saying is it doesn't work um, with the principles and in particular the accuracy principle. So watch this space, we'll definitely be reporting more on that as it happens. The last update for you is that on the 7th of May, uh, Wave, which is a British um, technology company dealing with automated vehicles, managed to raise 1 billion US in funding. Uh, it's one of the first UK companies to get its AI tech to receive that level of funding. Backers included Microsoft. Interestingly, we're reporting on it partly because it's uh, British tech doing well, but also partly because uh, the government has decided that this is a good time to say that that is evidence that its pro-innovation light touch regulation approach is working. Debate, we'll come back to it. Um, Let's look very quickly at the EU AI Act because uh, since we've last met, the legislature in the European Union has, pu has passed the bills, published the text, but it isn't in the OG yet. We've put the definition on the screen. I'm not going to read it to you in detail. Uh, it's a definition that looks fairly similar to others that you may already be familiar with, such as the OECD definition. It's not quite the same as that in the UK government's white paper, but it has all of the basic functional requirements. So um, machine learning, um, uh, various levels of autonomy, adaptiveness, uh, things of that nature. Um, we'll pick that apart in greater detail next time. The other thing you should know, and it's really important to take this away, is the designation. So the EU AI Act contains four types of designation for AI. They are prohibited, 
which means you can't use it at all. High risk, which means it's pretty high risk. Limited risk, which is chat GPT, LLMs, the kind of stuff that we're all using right now. And no risk, which means there is no regulate or very little regulatory red tape regarding it. In addition to the designation, you need to know about the profiles. There are four different profiles. They are provider, deployer, distributor, and importer. Most of us will be deployers, will be people, businesses using AI. Um, so if the EU AI Act catches you, it's important to know which profile you fall into and depending which profile you have, there'll be different regulatory duties on you, uh, ranging from very severe, uh, very restrictive, down to very light touch. The second to last thing I'm going to say about the EUA Act is the enforcement. It's pretty much the first thing that anyone asks. Uh, how much can we be fined if it goes wrong? And the answer is, well, it kind of looks a bit like the GDPR. Or it's sort of similar, at least in its logic, but the values are different. The top end is 35 million or 7% of worldwide turnover for the uh, most serious breaches to do with prohibited AI systems. Uh, the middle band is 15 million or 3% of worldwide turnover for non-compliance with uh, other obligations to systems and the lowest band is seven and a half million or one percent of worldwide turnover for supplying incorrect or misleading information. The very last thing I will say about the EU AI Act, and it's probably the most important thing of all, is that it isn't in force yet. If you take nothing else away, take that. It will um, be published in the official journal of the European Union, known as the OGU, at some point in the next few weeks. We're expecting it pretty much any time. There'll then be another period of four weeks where it's essentially a moratorium, it's on pause, and after that it will become in force. For those of you who can remember the GDPR, it was published in the OGU in uh, April 16, became law May 16, but with a two-year um, uh, suspension period. There'll be similar kinds of things in the EU Act, although it's not quite the same, it has a more staggered intro. All of that and more we'll do in the next webinar and in future webinars because the EUA Act is a very important thing for those of us practicing this area of the law. The last slide I wanted to show you before we move on is one slide that shows all of the AI governance laws as of May 2024. Thank you to all of our researchers for putting this together. You can see on the left hand side there are just two laws, the EUA Act and the um, PRC Generative AI Services Law. There are then nine draft laws spanning South Korea, Mexico, Brazil, the EU again, uh, the PRC twice, Canada and Chile, and last but not least, the United Kingdom with the Artificial Intelligence Regulation Bill. There are also three executive orders, which is a slightly different way of of regulating. Uh, they, of course, are the EU, uh, sorry, the American Executive Order on Trustworthy AI and also the Indonesian Presidential Regulation on AI and the Peruvian Law 31814. The reason all of that's there is to show you just how quickly the international world is moving to regulate AI, the different ways they are doing it, and the fact that it's happening in lots of places. That feels like a pretty good segue into our main feature. Uh, and let me welcome to the studio Lord Holmes of Richmond, Conservative Member of the House of Lords, Life Peer and MBE. Welcome to the Crypt Studio. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm afraid it is tradition that any guest on a Crypt's AI Data for Lunch webinar asks some embarrassing icebreaker questions before we start. Is it okay if I ask you some questions? Well, as a Conservative, and I should emphasize small c Conservative, small l Liberal, <laughs> tradition matters. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear it. Well, first question is, are you an early bird or a night owl? Definitely early bird. When I was swimming, I was lucky enough to compete for Great Britain for 16 years. The alarm clock would go off at 4.30 in the morning. It's, it's almost pre-early, isn't it? <laughs> it's almost, almost late. <laughs> um, second question, do you sing in the shower? And if so, what do you sing? Oh. <laughs> Extraordinary. Uh, well, in, in that it's uh, important to uh, give full disclosure in a law firm. <laughs> yes. And in that we can be completely real time with technology. Why not this morning? Um, others would have to judge. I would say a, a, a rather, um, rather unique version of uh, Dire Straits' uh, <laughs> latest trick. Excellent news, Dire Straits. 
Uh, I have to say I go with Taylor Swift as my general um, singing in the shower point. Please don't judge this audience. Um, dire Straits or Taylor Swift. Put that in the chat. Which one do you prefer? Uh, last icebreaker question. Which of the four flavours of original Pringles do you prefer? Being original salted, uh, sour, cr sour cream and chive, um, salt and vinegar or Texas barbecue? Such a redundant question. <laughs> Let, let's be honest, they're all good in that even bad crisp flavours are still great crisp flavours. <laughs> but it's obvious and I hope that everybody out there, 100% we want on this poll, it has to be sour cream and chive. <laughs> Excellent news. Sour cream and chive. I should say, by the way, audience, that we took this poll behind the, um, with the production team and others earlier. And it was sour cream and chive all the way, with one exception. Everyone knows it's the best flavour. Let's talk about the AI regulation bill, because that is actually why we're here. The first question I should ask you, I feel like you should know the answer. Pretty sure I know the answer, but there'll be plenty of people out there who don't, is what is a private member's bill? And why is it different to a government-sponsored bill? A good place to start. So as a backbencher, be you in the House of Commons or the House of Lords, so not a member of the government, at the beginning of each parliamentary session, you're able to bring a bill on whatever subject you choose. There's a bit of luck involved because it's a ballot mm. and you have to come really in the top 25 if you're going to have any chance of getting your bill to any, uh, any stages in the parliamentary process. Unfortunately, this last time, my AI regulation bill uh, came sixth. Excellent. Uh, and the effect of that is that it becomes published? Yeah, so what happens, you get to have the bill printed. First reading, which was on 22nd November last year, that's a procedural matter where I just read out the long title of the bill. Hmm. Then second reading, which is on 22nd of March, that's the most important first part really, because that's where Parliament gets its first opportunity to have a general debate on all the provisions and all the clauses within the bill. Uh, we got through that. Uh, I should say that even before I put pen to paper to draft the bill, I consulted widely with civil society, with creatives, with businesses, right across the piece to try and get the right sort of a bill mm. for the UK context, the UK circumstances. So I did all that before, got through second reading committee and report, and last Friday got it through third reading, and that's the last stage in the Lord. So I've got it through all of the stages in the Lords, it will now, get, now go down the, co the corridor to the Commons mm. and we're looking now to get a date penciled in for first reading down there. Very exciting. It's quite a short bill. Is there a strategic reason that you kept it so short, especially when it's compared with the EU AI Act at 892 pages? I think we all should have an obligation to make legislation, to make bills only as long as they need to be hmm. to do the job at hand. As you say, the EU AI Act is a valiant effort in all of its 892 pages. <laughs> it's highly prescriptive and you know, let's just say it'll be interesting. We have an opportunity in the UK to do something different, I believe, because of our great English common law tradition. We can legislate in a way which is dynamic, agile, adaptive to the technologies as they develop because of precedent and case law. So a very short bill, which I wanted to be principles based, outcomes focused, inputs understood and wherever necessary paid for and copyright and IP respected. Mm. And really the most important thing are those golden threads, the principles that run through every aspect of the bill. So trust and transparency, inclusion and innovation, interoperability and an international perspective, assurance, accountability, accessibility. Excellent. I feel like that's a good time for us to talk about some of the bigger issues that the bill creates and to start critiquing it and thinking about it, uh, some of the content. The first question I have to ask you is, the government has said that it will not legislate now about AI. You have published a bill now about AI. Does that put you in direct opposition with the government on this? It leads to a very interesting debate and conversation with government and with Number 10, because for at least two reasons, I believe it's time to legislate, it's time to lead. We had the Bletchley Summit 
last November, mm. very good. Important to look at the existential threats, of course. But having done that, it seems illogical to then not stand up all of the other elements where AI is already impacting people's lives, mm. oftentimes without them even knowing. Secondly, and this is a really critical point for business, for any organisations, for individuals out there. The government have said there will come a time when we will legislate on AI, <clears throat> but without saying when that will be, mm. what factors need to be in place for them to do that. Well, that is just the way to give birth to the biggest uncertainty, lack of clarity you could imagine. So without, we're saying you're going to legislate and then not doing anything, leaving that gap. What's the most likely certainly unintended but the most likely consequence mm. for businesses particularly they'll simply align with the eu ai act it makes sense but that will be a hugely suboptimal outcome for the uk especially when you consider the slide we looked at with the the international map of what's going on around the world the only reason the united kingdom's flag is on that slide at all is your private members bill i'm happy to have planted the flag on that chart. It's, uh, <laughs> it feels significant, particularly after um, Saturday night's Eurovision um, <laughs> Br British um, um, attempts. Good song, I thought. Good song, Ollie, to be fair. But why, why wouldn't we legislate at this time? What are we waiting for? Mm. And just as a general principle, I'm not convinced that at any point in human history, wait and see has been a positive approach. Wait and see is so clearly not a way to show leadership. Let me ask you about some of the more technical parts of your bill, which I should say I had a very good time reading, by the way. Uh, the first thing that comes straight out of the bill is that you propose to create an AI authority. How is that different to what the government proposed in its white paper with this central function for the existing regulators? Indeed. So I think for everyone listening, don't think huge, do it all, be a math of an AI regulator. It's not that at all. It's an agile, right sized regulator, the AI authority, that will do only what is necessary and nothing more. Horizontally focused. The difficulty with the government's approach is to have had a write out to existing regulators from the department. Firstly, you're only going to get vertical answers there. Second, you're not going to see where the gaps are. Third, you're not going to see how you can have a consistent, coherent approach in whatever sector of the economy or society someone may find themselves. So the critical function of my AI authority is to have this horizontal view across all existing regulators to assess their competency, to address the challenges, the opportunities of AI, to identify the gaps, similarly to do that with all relevant parts of the statute book to assess the law's competency and where there are gaps there. You have to have a horizontal view, it seems to me, if you've got any hope of enabling an economy-wide, a society-wide, consistent, coherent, clear approach to how the UK operates in terms of artificial intelligence. Regulation 4 of the bill proposes the creation of an AI responsible officer. Now, to me, that feels a little bit like the data protection officer from the GDPR. You know, we had nothing there and then this law created something. Um, obviously, they won't be exactly the same, but th thematically similar. Is this just creating more red tape for businesses? There are similarities. And again, because of the proportionality principle that runs through the whole of the bill, don't think about an individual. Mm. Think about a role a function, an office. So obviously for a startup, the requirements will be far less than for a multinational corporation. But it seems only right that for any entity that is developing, deploying, selling, operating with AI, that needs to be reported upon, um, not bureau bureaucratic or burdensome, mm. because it, the bill pulls on reporting obligations which all businesses will be very well aware of and comfortable with through the Companies Act 2006 and indeed where there are larger requirements what I would always say is set an AI to solve <laughs> an AI issue. Indeed makes a lot of sense to me. 
Let's go to the floor and take some questions from our virtual audience. First one is uh, straight onto the AI responsible officer um, from anonymous person. Um, they say, who is the right person in an organization to be this responsible officer? Am I just going to be stuck with another job title? <laughs> Not at all. I think there are obvious parallels with the DPO, but it's in no sense seeing it as that person. And it has to be a senior person within an organization. And again, the way the bill is constructed is deliberately clear that by having this person, it doesn't mean that the overall organization can then just abdicate its responsibilities mm. to that person. Really, the horizontal element, the AI responsible office, or I see internally having a similar role to the AI authority externally with the regulators there to thread together that horizontal approach across an organization. So really the board, mm. Exco, all layers have a responsibility for this. And that I think can be such a positive element within an organization to have a full understanding, a transparency as to everywhere that AI is involved. And through that process, it won't be a matter of just compliance and a painful job to do. From that, if you get it right, in the same way, if you get audit right, opportunities spring forth from that by having that level of understanding that's where you can see where opportunities will exist for further development of the technologies mm -hmm. uh, steve bond has asked a great question um is there decent guidance on what to tell data subjects about how machine learning and ai is being used with their data this is often difficult that is a pretty good segue into another question about regulation five of the bill which talks about human in the loop um how do you how do you see that working in practice? It's critical to have that level, as Steve says, of guidance in the mix because everybody needs to be enabled to understand what this is about, what we're trying to achieve with it. And that takes me back to the principles I mentioned. It's those principles that we're trying to achieve fundamentally that everybody out there feels that this technology and its use is trustworthy because mm. without that it doesn't matter how good the technology is it doesn't matter how good the business is it's not happening and potentially unfortunately individuals organizations will find themselves not able to appreciate the opportunities but almost certainly will find themselves saddled with the burdens of it so a critical element within all of this no matter how good the technology ever gets indeed human led human in the loop human over the loop when it gets to that stage but really having that sense of understanding these technologies as tools. That's not to underplay them, they're incredibly powerful tools. Mm. But I think if we perceive of them as tools, tools in our human hands, that gives us such a clear focus on how best to develop and deploy them. Isn't, isn't there always going to be an issue, though, where I mean, one of the one of the uh, books I really like, and I'm happy to plug, by the way, to everyone, is Jamie Suskin's Digital Republic. And in it, he talks about this idea of the consent myth, which is that if you, for any tech, anywhere, if you put something in front of someone that tries to explain to them what it's doing, the likelihood of them being able to engage and understand is, is really low, is, whether that's apathy, whether that's um, uh, an education thing, it could be anything, really. Um, are we going to encounter similar things with AI? I think that's a universal truth, which is not in any sense limited to technology. Mm. If someone is presented with a legal agreement, a contract, and they sign it, do they understand all the terms in it? There's a great push that we all need to be on for explainability, which mm. is again another clause which is within the bill. And it goes much broader than technology because if we don't, if we're not, able to communicate in plain English, simplifying the concept, simplifying the technologies, then we, we will have failed. Explainability, absolutely critical, but it goes across the piece in terms of informed consent in medicine, for example, mm -hmm. informed consent in any other environment. There's, there's so much more that yeah. we need to do as societies to give that real meaning so it's worthy of that sort of descriptor. That's a really good point. Um, Phil Wilney has asked, uh, one of the biggest challenges posed by Gen AI is the infringement of intellectual property rights. What, if anything, does the bill say about that? 
it says a lot and I consulted widely with our fantastic creative sector across the UK. The musicians that bring us such fabulous sound where otherwise we might just have silence. Writers who fill a blank page with words that mean and move us. So much on that. And it seems to me self-evident that everybody's IP, everybody's copyright, should be fully respected, mm. fully remunerated. It's not complicated. The sense of yeah, the, the frontierist refrain which you hear at any period of transformation, don't fence us in, we're doing something which is different. Not at all. The principles remain the same. Those who hold IP should be respected and remunerated for the use of that IP. It can't just be garrulously swallowed up by LLM and other elements mm. of AI without that being remunerated. That, that's so clearly not what one would want in any society. There's a great opportunity as well when you talk to creatives. They're not Luddites. Mm. Many, many of them want to engage with AI for the benefits you saw last week. Someone's voice being brought back through AI. Indeed. That's transformation. It's fantastic. But there's nothing wrong with that. But it always has to be with consent, with respecting the rights and with remuneration always where that is in play. That is, I mean, I, I agree, but it is an incredibly complex topic, isn't it? We've had, for those of you who may not know um, online, the uh, attempts between government and the Intellectual Property Office, Department of Science, Innovation, Tech and the creative industries broke down last year as they tried to resolve how to manage intellectual property rights and generative AI. I'm not sure many people in the know held a lot of hope in them doing anything anyway, but it, eventually it broke down in the white paper. One of the things that was more headline worthy in that was that there, there would be no proposal. Um, it, it feels like it's going to be incredibly hard to crack that nut, the IP versus gen AI nut. Um, and it sounds like what you're suggesting is really no gen AI without informed consent uh, and agreement from the rights holders. I think those who are currently benefiting from not respecting the rights make a case that it's more complex than it actually is. Mm -hmm. If one looks at underpinning principles, if one looks at where the law should be being applied, it's not that complex. It's mm -hmm. not that complicated. It was desperately unfortunate that <clears throat> the talks, as you say, around getting the code together were walked away from. I had a question to the minister last Thursday on exactly this topic. And it's clear that something needs to happen on this, but it needs to happen with far greater pace from the government. Because as every day goes on, that's more rights that are transgressed, more payments that aren't made to creatives who provide some of the most pleasing aspects of what it is to be human. There's, I agree, there feels like there's a complete lack of urgency on what is probably a very urgent topic. It's very, because as I say, going back to the government's position, there will come a time when we need to legislate, that time isn't now. Hmm. Well, in this specific area of creatives, IP and copyright, what does one do? Wait until it has all been purloined and then say, well, like, now, well, it's too late. It's already in the machine. It's already been taken. It's already been used. Hmm. We should act now because we know what we need to know to act now and it's not in any sense problematic because with the right approach which runs through all aspects of the bill which runs through the IP and copyright provisions it's pro-innovation pro-citizen rights pro-consumer protection mm. any regulation any legislation should hold all those three things simultaneously it makes it more tricky to draft but that is the way to resolve complex issues. There are loads of questions in the chat. Please do keep them coming. We'll get to as many as we can. Piers Claydon has said, isn't the light touch approach a false hypothesis, i.e. businesses will simply go to the EU compliance level, otherwise risk excluding a huge market on their doorstep? Excellent, thanks for that question. Great first name as well in this context, I must say. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I think the government's position is 
problematic. Mm. And my bill is neither light nor heavy touch. I hope it's right sized, right sized legislation, right sized regulation. And what we've seen as well through all of our history is that right sized regulation is a generator of innovation of inward investment. We've all seen bad regulation, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean regulation's bad. That means mm -hmm. that's just bad regulation. But when it's got right, look at what it draws in. Mm -hmm. Just one example, the regulatory fintech sandbox mm -hmm. that I was involved in 2016. Look at that. Not for me to say it's success, but replicated in well over 50 jurisdictions yeah. around the world. That's a pretty good measure of success. Right size regulation, clarity, certainty, security, safety and stability. That's great for innovation. The Financial Services Sandbox has been amazing. And it does seem to be one of those things, I don't know if it's, a, I don't know why this is the case, but we, we don't really bang the drum about that at all, do we? We don't. And similarly, the CMA9 order on open banking, we created open banking in this country. A fabulous use of technology to transform financial services, enabling individuals, taking friction, taking unnecessary costs out of it. We created it in this country as a regulatory intervention, mm -hmm. now replicates around the world in well over 60 jurisdictions. I'm going to um, wrap up the Q&A, but I, one of the most depressing things looking at this Q&A is that everyone thinks that Dire Straits is brilliant singing in the shower. There is not a single Swifty in the Q&A, which is both galling and disappointing for me. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question, and it's a big question. We wanted to give some time to debate some of the, the bigger philosophical things that, um, that this topic creates. And to do that, I wanted to read to you a quote from Henry Kissinger in uh, the last book before he passed away, co-authored with Eric Schmidt and Daniel Hurtlocker. That is The Age of AI, a fantastic book if you haven't read it. In it, at page 109, they say this, users of global network platforms are entering into a form of human machine dialogue that has never before existed. AI enabled network platforms have the capacity to shape human activity in a way that may not be clearly understood or even clearly expressible to a human user. This raises essential questions. With what objective function is this AI operating and by whose design and within what regulatory parameters? Who operates and defines the limits on these processes? If no human can fully understand or view the data created by AI systems at an individual level or access the steps involved in the process, should this future be comforting, unnerving, or both? That is Henry's question. I'd like to pose it to you. He poses a very good question on page 109. <laughs> and it goes to the heart of so much of what I've sought to get at in the bill. And firstly, what I'd say is, if we hold true to everything that it is to be human and everything that we know through being human, philosophy, critical thinking, values, psychology, economics, politics, and so forth, we will give ourselves the best opportunity to succeed together with AI. If we seek to believe we need to conquer it, that will be the wrong approach. If we believe that we swing it too far on the fear factor and we seek to control or kill it off, that will be the wrong approach. There was a fabulous lecture called Man and Machines, which raised a number of these issues mm. and touched upon it. It wasn't given this year, it wasn't given last year. It was given by the great Sir Edmund Leach in 1967 in the Reith Lectures. And it demonstrates that these threads have run through all of our human history. If you read a lot of the writings around when the railways were coming, mm. fabulous stuff, applicable then, just as applicable today when you look at the underlying essence. So we should neither be Panglossian nor terrified. If we retreat, that would be a disaster because we will leave it to others and it will be largely a small number of others in a winner-takes-all mm. model. If we get this right, we have such an opportunity. Even more than being augmented humans, we can have the most sharpest positive mirror put back at us to enable us to be so much better than we currently are. Who knows what's capable with the human self, the human spirit, the human soul, the human brain 
AI can really help us with that. We have to get cool with our cobalts. Mm. <laughs> um, and where do you see the United Kingdom? What is the future for us as a country in the next five, ten years as we live in a world that is increasingly more saturated by AI? We've got such a unique opportunity, not because I ever believe in UK exceptionalism, but because we have a phenomenal financial services ecosystem. Mm. We have the great good fortune of English language, the great good fortune of English common law. We have the time zone, we have the geography, we have the higher education sector, the further education sector, and we have connectivity right across the UK in terms of technology. But all of those are possibilities, none of them are inevitabilities. If we get it right, we could usher in the next future for all of us in terms of economic, social, psychological growth across the piece, as good as infinite opportunities, but we have to take them, and I'll tell you this, wait and see is not the way that we get to wait and be. Ah, excellent. Well, uh, Chris, thank you very much. I appreciate you making time to come in. and. Uh, I have to say that I agree entirely with the bill, its publication for all of the work I did in the consultation last year. Anyone who's watching that is involved with that will know that I think AI regulation is a really important thing too. And whatever happens with this bill, wherever the future of the United Kingdom's legislation on this topic goes, it will have your name at its genesis. So well done and thank you for publishing your bill. It's incredibly kind. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. And for everybody online, please do connect with me at LinkedIn at Lord Chris Holmes. I'd really love to hear all your thoughts, all your views, your perspectives and where you think this is all going. I'd love to connect, but it's been a total privilege and a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Likewise. Uh, we end every session by inviting our AI elves onto the panel. Uh, and we are down one AI elf. I'll get better soon, Jazz. Uh, we have uh, Louis and we have Alice who are um, going to give us a very quick update on the amazing things that they have seen AI doing uh, and because Jazz isn't here I've come I've just found one as well um, so I'll throw it into the mix and then because Chris is still here we might ask him which of these three is his favorite. Alice welcome back to the AI and data webinar what have you seen AI doing in the last three or four weeks? The World Economic Forum published a report at the end of April and that explores the potential for artificial intelligence to benefit educators, students and teachers. So administrative tasks for teachers can be streamlined with AI, allowing them to dedicate a lot more time to actually engage with students. Um, AI can personalise the learning experience, so the algorithms themselves can customise not only the content, but they can also adjust the pace, difficulty and learning style depending on the student. So that can allow for a much better adaptation to diverse learning needs. So AI teaching assistants essentially, something like yeah, that. So as an example, where you've got classroom lessons, those could be captioned for students um, who have auditory impairments and that would allow those students access to any classroom mm. rather than relying on the availability of a human uh, sign language assistant. That's, so, uh, that's pretty amazing. Louis, how are, we, how are you going to top that? So the, uh, <laughs> the founder and executive chair of Bumble this week has been talking about the possibility of AI generated bots and their involvement in uh, as users in a dating app as an example of how the uh, how the dating online dating experience might get worse in the short term. <laughs> Having said that, she mentioned that in the near future, it might be possible to develop what she termed AI uh, dating concierges that would um, give you tips if you were looking for a partner of how to relate to that partner better. And she then went on to talk about how it was possible that your AI dating concierge could talk to other day uh, dating concierges and how they got on on their virtual date would determine whether you went on a real date in real life. So truly chilling, I know. <laughs> well, I will, uh, I will throw this into the mix, um, which uh, is that I read, um, I give a big shout out to um, David Chaplin of SCL and the Computers and Law for bringing this one to my attention. But apparently in China, there is a very 
um, dramatic rise in the use of AI to resurrect deceased loved ones as an AI avatar so that you can have conversations with them about the things you didn't have conversations about before they passed away which see I, I don't even know what to say about that it seems so brilliant and so crazy all at the same time um, uh, with the minute that we have left Chris which of those three AI developments that we've heard about in the last three weeks do you think is the one that you would pick as your favorite we've got teaching assistants um, avatars that go on dates a dating concierge and the ability to resurrect your deceased grandparents through AI avatars it's still sour cream and chives <laughs> <laughs> but no they're all they're all good and all these things are tremendously interesting and they, they all have a role and are all worth thinking on but on that podium for sure the gold medal has to go to the education one because if we can truly deliver personalized education in real time connected to the rest of the class the teacher can be so much more empowered. The mm -hmm. students can be so much more empowered. It's part of what I was saying earlier, that sense of how much better we can be as individuals, as humans. So uh, that one, and in its human guise, Alice, as the bringer of it, does get this month's gold medal. Congratulations, Alice. Well done. It was very cool. Good researching. Um, that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you for tuning in to the Crips AI and Data for Lunch webinar. Hope you've enjoyed yourselves. We will be back uh, at the slightly later time of 12.30 on the first Monday of June, uh, Monday the 3rd of June, 12.30, put it in your diary. We'll be doing a digest of the Experian case, looking at all the fascinating insights that that will have for everyone who practices tech and data law. And we will have Robin Hopkins, the barrister who represented Experian, in the chair taking my questions and yours so until then thank you very much for joining uh, thank you to all of the production guys and everyone behind the scenes who've made this happen thank you very much to alice and louis and of course to lord chris holmes of richmond <laughs>